ninety percent of venture capital goes to straight white men in the United States. That doesn't make any sense. I could either be really, really mad about it and yell and scream, which I did, or I could do something about it. Hi everyone, it's Kara Golden with the Kara Golden Show, and I am so excited to have my next guest here. Uh, she's one of my Twitter buddies, and I've admired so much of her work over the years. Arlen Hamilton, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great to see you. I'm very excited for my next guest. She's the founder and partner of Backstage Capital, which provides seed funding to companies whose founders come from underrepresented groups in the startup world. And prior to her world of venture capital, Arlen Hamilton founded and published the indie magazine Interlude. Very, very cool. And that was after serving as a tour manager for Atlantic Records. I can't wait to dig in to hear a little bit more about that. And last but not least, she is a fellow author of a new book, which is so good, uh, called It's About Damn Time, How to Turn Being Underestimated into the Greatest Advantage. So, so much to talk about here. And one other thing, she was recognized by Business Insider as one of 23 most powerful LGBT people in tech, which is super, super amazing. And yeah, so much of your journey to talk about. Welcome. And, uh, I'd love to hear just how, who was little Arlen? How did this all start? <laughs> I don't know if I ever was little Arlen, you know, uh, from, from what I hear. I was very odd, I think, but not in a, in a good way, like in a, in a, I was eccentric already as a young kid. Like, for instance, I used to wear six watches at the same time in the third and fourth grade. And why six, do you know? That's what could fit on my arms. Uh, and they were all <laughs> cheap, you know, cheap watches, including some Velcro ones that I would love to have again. I've been on a hunt for some. But they were, I would get them out the bubblegum machine or I'd have something that I'd find in, a, in one of those claw machines at the store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where it stemmed from was that I, my mom bought us an encyclopedia set, I guess from a traveling salesperson. And I learned about time zones at a very young age. And I just remember I would read the encyclopedias all the time. And I've learned about time zones and it just blew my mind that people, that there were people in other places that the sun was down when the sun was up went where I was and vice versa. And so I set each of them to a different time zone and it kind of based their location on the design of the watch. So I had a tropical one that was for Hawaii and one with the giraffe that was for Africa, parts of Africa. I love this. And I, it, so that at any given time during the day at school, I could know what time it was for somebody else. And that, to me, it was the most fascinating thing in the world. Or very, very close to um, having my first business in the fifth, you know, my first budding company in the third grade. Those two things are just so fascinating to me. Time is really it is a fascinating thing. I think I learned about now that you're talking about this, I learned about time because my dad traveled a lot and uh, mm. he was uh, building a product called Healthy Choice inside of a large food company, but he was always on the road. And so, you know, when we call him, he'd be on a different time zone. So it, but it, yeah. I remember it, it really is kind of fascinating, especially for a kid to kind of think. Wow, I wonder what they're doing, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's yeah, sort of mind blowing. Fascinating. I'm still fascinated by it. You know, we still try to figure right? out what time it is in some, some country we're trying to get on a business call, but I think a little bit of it is wonderment still. Yeah. No, it's, it's so very cool. And so where did you grow up? I grew up in Dallas, Texas. In I Dallas. was born okay. in Jackson, Mississippi, where my mom was raised. Um, and, but very quickly we moved to Texas, grew up there and, Went to the same school brand, um, the school name from kindergarten to, to graduation, even though we moved around half a dozen times throughout that period. We were always in the same school district. So uh, luckily had that, but pretty much grew up without like very, with very little money. And we moved so much because we would just kind of owe rent and we'd have to start over somewhere and kind of declare a type of bankruptcy, you know, not a real one, but um, so I spent a lot of time understanding that we didn't have money. That was made very clear to me early. 
and I, I started working when I was 15 and, and handing over my paychecks and, you know, to help out. But I also kind of started learning at 15, learning from the, the, the companies I worked in about what would be helpful to me now. So I guess it was, it was for something. Absolutely. Interesting. And so you stayed in Dallas until what was kind of your step out of Dallas? So I was a a gifted student, uh, but I was always in trouble. I was always speaking up and speaking out. And so I spent a lot of time in the vice principal's office. So I didn't really want to, for that reason, because we didn't have any money, I didn't really want to go to four more years of school that that I felt was going to be like that, which obviously college is different, but I didn't realize that. And so really when I graduated, um, I was there for another couple of years, but all I wanted to do was get away from where I was, where I was grown, where I grew up. And today as an adult, I loved Alice. Um, but at the, back then, all I wanted to do is get, get the heck out of there. So I spent some time in Mississippi back with family, um, when we didn't have much going. Then I just bounced around. I was in California, San Diego starting out and I was in, like near the Midway Airport in Chicago, which is not like being in Chicago, but like in the winter. I know time. where Midway is for sure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's not because I live like I lived in that area. So I just bounced around to different places where, in your early twenties, people will let you crash in their couch or you whoever you're dating. You know, you kind of join forces, but uh, that just kept going. That just kept happening, and I would I spent a lot of time in Columbus, Ohio, with friends and. Just bounced around a lot. Couldn't get my bearing anywhere. But I did, along the way, make some really good friends, and I made some good connections, and I did a lot of different things, you know, for a career. So did you, and how did you get to being a tour manager? Was that kind of the first real job then? Or No, I mean, well, I, no, well, I guess so. I mean, the first real job, yeah, it's hard to say because everything has been such a, just a non-linear path. But when I was still in Dallas and I was working data entry at a, a, a 10 key, doing 10 key by touch data entry at a bank lockbox, which makes me want to like go to sleep saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I was so bored. And, and and no, no offense to anybody who does that today because who's listening to this, because I appreciate you and I know you, but it, you, you know, it can be a little bit monotonous and soul sucking. And so I, I just came across this band, this cute band that I thought they had cute music. They were from Norway. I don't know how I came across them. I was listening to music to pass time at this lockbox shop, just like keep me awake somehow. And I I got in touch with them on AOL chat because that's what it was. It was like 19, 20 years ago. I got in touch with them and I said, I, sh- I would love to see you play live. And they they the the lead singer Toke is this tells you kind of what kind of band it was because his, his nickname is Toke <laughs> his, his real name is Torkel but uh uh he was he's like yeah we live in Norway you know and I said well if I can book you uh, some shows out here will you come out here and he said yeah if you can book shows for us that are solid shows we'll we'll make the effort and come out and pay for it and everything so I taught myself how to book a tour uh over the summer I or over the spring or so I taught myself how to book a tour. I put them on a two month tour of the country and they came out and I went on tour with them and I had no idea. I mean, this was back when I had like, I had folders on the floor for each city. I had printouts of MapQuest. You know, there wasn't like just me Googling things and figuring it out. I had to call these places one at a time and figure it out. That's wild. And were they actually with a label at this point or? Oh, no. They were like on an indie label, but I mean, these were, this was a garage band in Bergen, Norway. I mean, this was as, as, you know, out of there as you can think of left field pop punk music, completely wild, different thing going on, but I just loved it. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a solutions based person. I didn't really realize that at the time, but it was just to me, it was so logical. It was like, it was a logical conclusion of, I want to see them play live. They can't play live here because they don't know how to like book a tour they had tried before. So I'll just book a tour for them. <laughs> you know, it was just, I love it. there was never any hesitation of, Oh, that sounds crazy to me. Cause it didn't sound crazy to me. It just sounded like, Oh, that's what you need in order to come over here. Cool. I'll figure it out. Well, I talk a lot about as the founder and CEO of hint that, you know, I, I, 
I definitely knew that I was launching a company and, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, but I kind of decided to sort of forget about that and instead figure out the steps. I had to figure out how to get a product on the shelf. I had to figure out how to make enough product, like all of these little steps yeah. along the way. And that's what you do, right? And then suddenly you wake up one day and you're like, oh, like it's kind of working. I'm scaling. I'm getting yeah. into more markets, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure. And uh, that's that's awesome. I, I love, I absolutely love that story. And so how long did this tour go on, go on for? So I did that two years in a row for them. I booked them. I booked every date, which it was a big, you know, undertaking. We did two two summers across the country, and uh, I mean, these were like bar dates. They were like small clubs, like rock little rock clubs, where they would get an op- I get an opening for them, opening slot. It might be five people in the bartender, or it might be two hundred people because there was a bigger show. Um, but it was always a good time. It was always fun. So I did that. And then, you know, that wasn't going to be sustainable. It didn't make any money. It was, it was just for the love of it. And, and we kept each other, like, you know, they make some money on the road. We go to the next place and you know, all share a hotel room. It was got, got really good at pretending that the bassist and I were hunt, were honeymooning while the rest of the band snuck into the room. <laughs> and, I, and my rule, my oh only my rule was I always get a bed. Like, I don't care what you all have to do. I was going to bed. And these, you know, these guys are teachers and parents and all that now. And they were just a, the most amazing group of guys, even though they were these punk rocker guys who didn't know how to wear a shirt uh, when the, on their days off. <laughs> um, but then I, I realized I wanted to do this more. So I started working with, with individual singer songwriters and that became really interesting. So I would book the tours and then, and then go on tour with one person or maybe one person in there, one musician with them. I did that for, for quite a while and, and got my chops and then skipped a step. You know, I don't know if you want to skip a step, but eventually went on to much bigger tours, like arena level tours. That's wild. Who was the biggest one that you worked on? Um, I would say like for me, the biggest was Toni Braxton because I mm-hmm. grew up listening to her. I was sort of, I learned every song that she I had. Love and that. It was a huge moment for me to have her. The first day I w- worked with her, um, I was her tour coordinator. And so there's a tour manager, production coordinator. I was the tour coordinator who works with the people, kind of getting people from place to place and uh, supporting the tour manager. And the first day I walked in was a rehearsal day. And she comes up to me and, you know, it's Tony Brack. To me, it's like, I don't know, there's only to- only Janet Jackson would have been more incredible yeah, like godlike right yeah and so yeah. she she comes up to me and she just puts her hand on my shoulder and she's like finally a woman in production yeah you know oh, and she awesome. was just so cool and i just watched her do her songs and um, got to know her family a little bit while they were filming their show and that was great we also worked with jason derulo and CeeLo and uh the king's men tour which was a gospel tour with kirk franklin that was on live nation so about 10 to 15,000 people a night would, wow. would watch these gospel artists. Um, and, and I, I love gospel music, but I'm um, an atheist. So it was, a, it was very interesting. It was interesting. Uh, like the music just, but. Oh, it, I love the music. And I, yeah. the, the, the musicianship was so f- incredible. 40 people on stage every night. I, any one of them could, could win American Idol every year. You know, it was just absolute stunning musicianship. That's amazing. What do you think was the big thing that you learned from doing that role? Oh, you you just can't help but to learn how to work with all kinds of people from all backgrounds and profiles at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, that role is a very, it's all about people. Like I don't have a technical prowess. And so this is all about getting 40 to 70 people or in the, the indie case, maybe one to 10 people from city to city in a traveling circus and, very high stakes when you get to the arena level. I mean, you're talking a lot of money. And so I was never, um, you know, I didn't stay on the path. So I I was never a tour manager for a major artist. I was a tour manager for Atlantic. So a mid-level artist, but in any case, we're talking a lot of money and we're talking a lot of ego in some cases and a lot of stakes, a high stakes. Yeah. And to be able to imagine. Yeah. To be able to just look at um, that chaos and, remain calm in it and be someone's uh, calm and peace for them in the craziest of situations. It was an 
absolute masterclass and work. I mean, working in venture is a cakewalk. <laughs> in, in comparison. I mean, not building the fund for sure, but like working in venture compared to being on the road and these moving pieces. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I've I've gotten to know actually one of our investors is um uh, is John Legend and one of his mm-hmm. uh and his tour manager Hassan and I have had many conversations about this cuz he keeps and I think John would say this he you know makes it happen. I mean it yep. is really Hassan yep. has been with him um forever and he really is uh He's he's uh, shared a, a a world with me that I didn't know really existed, but it really it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's a lot it's, of work, right? And for, yeah. like you said, personalities along the way, and it's just it's crazy. So you went, you then went on to launch a magazine, and how did this come about? Yeah, I did that kind of in the middle. So between the indie stuff and the more mainstream stuff, the professional stuff. I launched a music magazine originally. It was a music magazine called Interlude. And um, that would have been, I would have been 24, 25, so 2004 or 5. And uh, I I remember walking to, uh, to my roommate's room and just saying, I, I want to start a magazine. And the thing there is the same thing with the with the touring. I couldn't find the magazine in the United States that made me feel like I could read it. My my brother, who's a rapper in, in the South, could read it. My friends, who may be, you know, Lilith Fair types in Portland, Oregon, could read it. All of the same magazine. And I thought, mm-hmm. well, how interesting would it be if we had a magazine like that for music, which I love. And then on top of it, it was a really high quality, almost like a t- um, coffee table quality. I remember. It. Yeah. No, I was, it's a great book. And then you, so you ran that. Um, I did. And then- <laughs> Yeah. And then when that did was you hard. Just, yeah. And you decided because it's mostly ad driven or that's how you. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. You know what yeah. I mean? I was. I didn't I didn't have a co-founder of, you know, really, I didn't have any any guidance and I didn't understand what it took to do this. I just knew that I had something that other people didn't have, which was a certain vision. Mm-hmm. And that the willingness to kind of just go all in. And um, so we, we, we put out a few issues and they were just, you know, got overwhelmingly positive reviews. And the, the, the one of the designers of Ro- Rolling Stone magazine got in touch with me and said, I'd love to meet your team. And I'm looking around my two bedroom apartment in El Cajon <laughs> and saying, so you, you're meeting them. <laughs> I, you I know, we had so many contributors, but. They thought that it was coming from some office in, in New York or something. And so I knew I was on to something, but I just couldn't make the numbers work. I may still, but I, I had a really hard time pricing things back in the day. So I would mm-hmm. – this magazine, which was like coffee table, should have been $14, $16. It's quarterly. I sold it for 5 bucks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's almost what it cost to put it together. And I did it because I was – my thing was – accessibility and I don't want to be bougie and I don't, you know, all those things, but it, the unit economics didn't work. It's great to understand that today and be able to, to talk to people, founders, uh, you know, and, and let them know it's okay to be wrong there. But at the, I think that's what was holding us back. And I also just was going through some personal stuff and it ended up being a really dark time when it had to go under. It was like the culmination of a lot of things in my life. And um, in the end of a lot of things, like including personal relationships and, all, you know, my finances were just in shambles. And it was a really dark period uh, right around 2008. Um, weirdly enough, right right when Obama was elected, which I, of course, appreciated. But at the same time, I didn't even know. I didn't know enough about business back then to know that there was a was a, a recession happening. That there was a, you know what I mean? I didn't know yeah. that the rest of the country was, was aching. I had no idea. I thought it was just me. 2009 was brutal. Yeah. Had no brutal. idea. And then all of a sudden these other magazines started going under, like Vibe went under. And I had grown up on Vibe magazine and all these magazines started going under. And I'm like, wait, maybe it wasn't just me. And, and uh, maybe I don't have to be so uh, terrible to, you know, with myself. And so it was such a learning experience. It's one of the, the biggest proud you know the proudest moments of my life I would say because I think I I think we pulled off like me and the contributors I think we pulled off such a beautiful 
exactly what I imagined in my head that first day magazine. And of course, I always have I always have something up my sleeve. So there will be a point in time where I come back with something that is a an ode to that for sure. Now that I have a different life. That's awesome. So you're it's you know, 2008, 2009, super challenging time. Um, and so when did Backstage Capital actually, I mean, how did that come about? Because you didn't have experience and like you yeah. said, in business. And then how did you really start incubating this in your mind? Well, 2009 till 2011-ish, what I was doing was uh, I was a production assistant to, to just random things. So I would just go where I could find work, mostly because being a production assistant, they would let you kind of wear whatever you had. And so I didn't have any wardrobe and I still don't, which I think is so funny that the same thing that held me back so much is the thing that I can do now. You know, it's, it's amazing what money and influence can get you. But anyway, um, I was doing like one off one off days or weeks at a time as a production assistant on like reality TV. So one born every minute. It's a lifetime show about people giving birth. So I saw something like 20 live births happen from the time the the mother walked into the hospital room till 30 hours later when she left with the baby. I watched on camera. Obviously, they knew about it and they were on it. But I watched and and typed every word that they said, everybody in that room said for for however my shift was. I was a, a production uh, assistant on um, Biggest Loser and different things, one offs. And so I was I went I moved back to Texas. I had been in California for a little bit, moved back to Texas and I got my first gig as, you know, on the mainstream touring and that's when I started learning about people like Ashton Kutcher and people like Troy Carter, who used to be Lady Gaga's mm-hmm. manager, a black man in the, in the industry. They were like making these $50,000 investments in a place called Silicon Valley. And I learned that through an Ellen DeGeneres and different people. And I'm like, why are they doing that? And why is why is no one else paying attention to this? But they are doing it. The people who have the money are doing it, but no one on their team seems to care. So I just mm-hmm. started looking and observing and researching, asking questions. So around 2011-ish is when I started researching the most. And I said, wow, I'm going to start my own tech company because I I understand myself now. I understand all those ups and downs meant that I was just like, I'm going to say it's going to sound like really tacky, but this is what came to mind. I was like, I'm a visionary entrepreneur, but most importantly, entrepreneur. And that's yeah. what I am. And that's why things haven't fit in a perfect circle, you know, like my friends have health insurance and apartments and leases and car payments and everything. I I had none of that. Um, So I started out, I wanted to start a company. And that's when I found out 90% of venture capital goes to straight white men in the United States Mm -hmm. or straight um, identifying white men in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a second, that's stupid. (laughs) That doesn't make any sense because they only make up a third of the country. And I'm not, any of those things. So let's see. Um, I could either be really, really mad about it and yell and scream, which I did, or, or, and I could do something about it. And that's when I decided, what if there were a fund that only invested or did the opposite? That was the original idea. What if it were 10, what, 90, 10 rather than 10, 90? Um, look, we, so we still to this, to this day have a little sandbox for white men. Um, you know, if we're feeling um, charitable or uh, feeling like we want to, you know, go out and see others. Um, But it just dawned on me one day. And then I, I said, you know, let me start talking to founders and see what they need. And I had no money at this time, no money to speak of. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is wild, right? Because you're, (laughs) I mean, you, because you, even though you may not have called yourself technically an entrepreneur, I mean, so much of the stuff that you did, I mean, even being, you know, running this tour, you had no idea what you were doing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you were, you definitely see the, the entrepreneurial spirit, the curiosity, the resilience, all of those things. But like, how did you, I mean, that's such a big thing to say, I'm going to go raise a fund, right? And I'm going to go figure out how to do this. I mean, this is, 
This is just yeah. awesome and wild. I mean, how did you, what was kind of the steps and as the first steps? Same kind of thing as this coming to the conclusion. You know, once I come to the conclusion of something, I, the rest of it is kind of, you know, it's going to happen in my opinion. So I, once I understood what the problem seemed to be that, well, in my opinion at the time, this would have been 2011 through 14 was when I was developing this and asking for capital, not getting it. But my thought was, uh, and it was more of a, an innocent thought that has been shifted since, but it was the reason these investors who are quote unquote untraditional investors are not investing in black and brown founders or women founders, LGBTQ founders is simply because they didn't know they were supposed to or that they existed. And as soon as someone shines a light on that, they're going to be just they're going to understand the value proposition because, mm-hmm. of course, they're they're this they're supposed to be the smart ones or the good, the, the experts here. And mm-hmm. so when I had that true, that genuine thought, my process was, OK, you're broke, you're poor, never had money, homeless on food stamps. <laughs> but of course, you're going to raise a million dollars to invest in because these the people are going to get it. So I set out to do it, and it was – the more I worked on it, the more founders I met who were all of these, you know, descriptors. And I just saw things that were being built that had to exist in the world. And I could not believe that the only thing holding them back was somebody's belief in them and a little bit of seed money, a little bit of seed money. And I didn't I didn't think it was right that there were just a few gatekeepers who got to say, yes, this can go on and be innovative. And no, this can't, especially when so many companies by by nature fail. Why aren't we taking more chances? It just didn't seem logical at all to me. And I have to make it make sense. So I just said um, it's a numbers game. Like when I was trying to get the mainstream gig working on tours. I emailed a hundred tour managers and production managers. And I said, because mm-hmm. not, a, not everybody's going to read it and not everybody's going to say yes when they do. So I, I did, had done that previously, sent out a hundred, got 20 responses, got three in-person interviews and got my first big gig. So I said, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to research everybody there is to research. I'm going to reach out to all of them, tell them what my value prop is and what the, the value prop of this thesis is. And we're off to the races. At the beginning, it, uh, it was far too convoluted and too too long of emails and so many things I learned that I try to teach people now because I get it. And I get I literally have people doing this to me. So I know that it's not helpful. But I did meet with some people early on who were intrigued, I guess is the best way to put it, and who would give me a little bit of an arrow to the next person and didn't get any investment for the first three and a half years solid. And all wow. through that time was um, experiencing various degrees of poverty and um, food insecurity and however other polite way of saying it. But what I did understand was I the the money may not be coming in, but the deal flow sure is. Mm-hmm. The deal flow is people consistent. Were curious and yeah. Well, the people, the founders existed, and I'm to me, I was like, they're not going anywhere. They're they're not gonna. This isn't going to stop. This is only going to get more fruitful and more expert and more well done. This is not going to be something that just happens and then it goes away in a vacuum. So to me, if I was seeing something that was a diamond in the rough on a day to day basis, can you imagine what's going to happen over the next few years? I just followed the logical steps of, in my view, of they're go- these are going to be future tech titans. The woman with the baby on her hip right now is going to be what it looks like in 10 years. And in fact, I think didn't Whitney just somebody rang the bell. Or maybe it was Katrina Lake. Someone rang the bell, IPO'd with the baby on their hip. Yeah. Whitney. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And I mean, I just saw this in different. I saw it with women across the board. I saw it with LGBTQ founders. I saw it with black founders, Latinx founders, indigenous, Asian, et cetera. And I just said it's obvious that the future is going to be more and more people understanding that they can start companies just the same way where a few, several years ago, you couldn't start a company for less than a few million dollars. And then there was this boom where you could start a company for less, like for a hundred K or less places like Y Combinator um, came up 
tech stars came up. I said the same thing is going to happen with this new demographic of founder because they already exist. They're just going to have access to resources and take it and run. And yeah. why not? Why wait for it to happen when you can actually be someone who catalyzes that happening? Yeah, I love it. Well, and I think that the other thing is, is that I always talk a lot about is, especially in the early days, I mean, we had our own story of, of trying to raise money on Sand Hill Road. And, you know, I mm-hmm. walked in, I, I had four kids. I was not the profile that you wanted to invest in. I had four kids under the age of six. Wow. And, um yeah, and uh, actually, it's a really funny story. Funny, it wasn't funny at the time. It's funny to like look back on it now. But I walked into you know kind of the A list Silicon Valley Sand Hill Road office, and they had actually reached out to us and mm. knew that I was a tech executive. I used to be at America Online, and that I had started this oh, company. Hint, a little and, chat, and there you go. Yeah, exactly. I've been on chat many times, and so. <laughs> I, uh, you know, pull up into the parking lot and uh, my husband was actually parking the car and I walk up the steps and and the partner was sees me walk up the steps. And he said, uh, I, I was, you know, welcome. I was doing some research on you. And wow, you have you have four kids under under the age of six. And I said, I, I do. And he said, uh, so who's watching the kids? And I, and I, so automatically, I mean, you could not have like told me that might happen because it was just my pearls to clutch. (laughs) Oh my God. And so I I looked at him and I said, (gasps) and he said, are you okay? And I said, oh yeah. Oh gosh. I, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but there's actually babysitters. For yes. like and their, husbands and, and wives, and right? But here's my, of... my husband was our chief operating officer, so he's parking the car. He has no yeah. idea about this conversation. So he walks up the steps and he sees kind of this awkward moment. Yeah. And we uh, and the uh, he said, "Is everything okay?" And I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, it's fine." I was just telling him that we got a babysitter for the kids, and you know, and that was it. Anyway, we did the pitch. It was fine. He didn't invest. People have always asked me over the years, did he, do you think he, he didn't want to see you anymore? And that's why he didn't mm-hmm. invest. And I said, no, he had never invested in a beverage company before. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we probably shouldn't have even been there in the first place. But right. anyway, it was funny because about three years later, I see him with some other people, happens to all be men, but that's not really the important part of the story as much as he, he sees me and he said, ah, oh, you know, you're in Google, you're in Facebook, you're, I mean, I should have, I should have really invested. And he, and then he went on to tell the guy that was with him, he said, do you know what I said to Kara? And he said, what did you say? And he said, the first thing that I said to her when she walked in the building was who's watching the kids. And you know what she did? And I'm just standing there, like wondering if he is actually going to say this. And he said, she looked at me and she acted really startled. And she said there was a babysitter. And he said, that was probably one of the dumbest things that I have ever said. And you know what, Kara? I've never said that again. Love it. Right? Love it. And I said, said, that's awesome. Right? I mean, what can you say? Right? So that's the thing that. People say stupid stuff, right? Because they think stupid stuff. They say stupid stuff because they think stupid stuff. And you have the ability to, to, when they say stupid stuff, you have the ability and the permission to respond back, right? And maybe you'll teach people and maybe you won't, right? But maybe you will. But anyway, that was my, uh, along the way, you know, my stupid story of dealing, of dealing with that. And, you know, it's I think that the other thing that I learned about about these different companies is, look, people invest in what they know. They mm-hmm. they won't necessarily tell you that, but that's what they do. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. and they're not risk takers. A lot of, yeah. you know, they may invest in Ashton stuff, and I'm sure Ashton is nice. But, it, you know, mm-hmm. you just you can't sit there and compare yourself in, in one way. I mean, people are going to do what they're going to do. 
and you have to, and that's why your VC is so essential to be able to invest and not be the same type at all. So some of the stuff that, you know, once you actually got it going, I mean, I'm not going to do it justice. So so tell people sort of what has happened over the years, because I mean, it's been an incredible success story. Yeah. So since getting the first 25K check from Susan Kimberlin in fall of 2015, actually September 2015, um, because I had spent years preparing, I was off to the races. I had deal flow. Susan started helping me introduce, you know, introduce me to more people. They would introduce me to more people. It still has been up until this day has been a uphill climb. So nothing ever got easy. But over those five and a half years, Backstage has built a team. We have invested in more than 180 companies led by underrepresented, underestimated founders. We we have our own jargon in the ecosystem, including underestimated People treat get it becoming a backstage headliner, which is what we call our portfolio companies, as the same as getting into a top college or top accelerator. Um, there's a lot of pride there. I was the first black woman non-celebrity to be on the cover of Fa- uh, Fast Company in 2018. Which was an so, incredible photo. I was cheering. Yeah, you. yeah it was so yeah, great. I miss that. COVID has. Uh, I miss my brows and my hair, but I can't wait. I'm coming back, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they were on the leak. Uh, but before that was the black women who had been in that cover before that were Oprah, Serena, and Beyonce. And no tech yeah, or investing person of, uh, who was a black woman. And, um, you know, we've we raised almost five million, like just around five million dollars in a reg CF that was pretty groundbreaking. So many companies themselves can now raise up to five million dollars publicly on a, on a reg CF, uh, like a, different platforms. Um, but we were the first or one of the first. I'm not allowed to say the first, even though I think we were the first funds to raise for operating costs to kind of offset management fees. Because we had we never raised we raised about 15 million dollars over those years. And, you know, about, you know, twenty five thousand to one hundred thousand dollar investments in companies. And then we've been able to invest as much as a million in follow on into companies, but we never had a a lot of money at once to have a management fee that would cover expenses. So we did something pretty groundbreaking in March, 2021 and um, raised 5 million for, for operating. And so we just keep trying to innovate. Um, I have, like you said earlier, have my book out. It's about damn time. I have a second, I sold my second book that comes out in 2022 uh, that I'm writing now with my co-writer, Rachel Nelson, and we're just moving. We're moving. We have a, a, a 1,200 it. accredited investors on BackstageCrowd.com who help us make investments, follow on investments into companies in a syndicate. And I'm teaching at Arlen's Academy now for entrepreneurs. One track and another track is for investors. And in, in, in fact, 85% of the, of the people who signed up for my investing course, to my surprise, were people who identified as women, people of color, LGBTQ. And two thirds are unaccredited. And so I get, I get to see every week the future of investing and it's angels. It's the crowd and it is diverse. And so I love it. That, because of the way the SEC works now, we have that $5 million limit max, which is a lot more than it used to be. And you have so many angel investors who don't have to be on one street in one city in the country. Yeah, The future is you. The future is the individual coming together as the crowd, and it is really, really exciting. And that's what I wake up now thinking about is how do I catalyze more founders and how do I catalyze more aspiring and and, and current investors? And because you've really got two audiences that you speak to, too. I mean, you still do, right? And that's... uh, I mean, that, that's just a lot. So the, the book, you touched on that. It's about damn time. So good. What would you like people to take away from the book? I absolutely hope this for people, and I hear it in the feedback overwhelmingly, is that they most people think that they're going to read a book about me, and they realize they're reading a book about themselves and with my lens. And it really, the reason I wrote it was so the people who asked, you know, can you be a mentor? Can you be an advisor? I wanted to have that mentorship in a box and just that push. I mean, it's a business book. It is on a business imprint at Penguin Random House, which was very called Currency, which was very important to me because, again, representation. 
but mm-hmm. it also has that push that I think a lot of people feel they need, which is like a direction and then letting them know they can do it. And then the bonus of how, <laughs> like those are my favorite types of books are that are nonfiction are not just in reading about someone's life, but understanding how I can apply it to myself. And I have a lot of that in this book. It's about damn time. It's a, because it's about damn time for all of us, but also for us individually to get what is ours. Yeah. And I think that that was the inspiration that I got out of your book, too, was that you can do it. But you, mm-hmm. you know, there's a million every single day you can put walls up in front of yourself to say why you can't do it. And, you know, I think that your story is just so inspiring and definitely yeah. one that is uh Great. One, my favorite chapter was the danger of hustle porn. So yep. Uh, yep. Do, do you want to just talk about that real quick? Yeah, it's just that idea. A couple of things, you know, you first of all, we just compare ourselves a lot on social, whatever our ages. We talk about a lot of teenagers doing this, but uh, certainly a 40 year old right here does. You know, you think about whether well, on that vacation or they have those those things happening in their life. And you have to really think about what happens between the Instagram posts. Because people will, will will put their best foot forward. And in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of people are very authentic. I try to be. But even I, when you go to my Instagram, you're not going to see. I'm not going to take a picture of myself necessarily, not yet at least, just crying on the floor in a fetal position because that happens too, you know. That happens right yeah. next to the headline in the Fast Company cover. So there's that and just kind of pulling back from trying, like, letting ourselves um, compare ourselves to each other. Because I guarantee you uh, I've met, so, like, thousands of people in my life and, all of your favorites have someone else that they're that they're um, jealous of. Mm-hmm. All of your favorite people have that. And then the other thing is this idea um, that that is getting better, I think. But for so long, there was this idea of um, you have to work every second of every day, or you're not a real quote unquote entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And it was coming from this, you know, sleep when you die um, mentality or if you're not hustling, if you don't have five side hustles and B plan through Z plan, you're not doing it. And the truth is, I don't think there is a such thing as a four hour work week. I don't think there's a such thing as only, you know, sleeping your way, you know, not sleeping your way, um, resting your way through life. Right. So I don't think on that way that you can, I think there's a lot of execution that has to happen, but I do believe it has to happen in spurts. And then there has to be just as much rest, if not more. And when you look at when someone says to you, or you hear it or see it, you got to work weekends, you got to hustle you, the first person awake, early bird, blah, blah, blah. Please look at the source mm-hmm. and see if that source has seven people on their their personal team that reminds them when to wake up, that takes care of everything else in their life. And for the most part, that kind of rhetoric is coming from men. And for the most part, men do not take on, I mean, this is just a fact, it's not a bias. They do not take on the majority of the household uh, caretaking. Yeah. And so they can afford to get on a stage with their little hot mic, you know, Britney mic, and say, you got to, you got to hustle till you die. And and give this out. And someone someone is sitting there making eleven dollars an hour with two kids at home and is feeling bad about themselves because they can't hustle like that person. They don't have the infrastructure to hustle like that person. You can't hustle like me if you don't have the two assistants that I have and the now augmented privilege that I have with my with my influence and and capital. Yeah, it's so true. And I I'm the first person to say, you know, sometimes you do have to take a break. Right. And uh, and take some time. And it, and people will say, don't take too long. Don't do, you know, whatever. People don't really know. Right. You need to figure mm-hmm. out what's right for you more than anything. So I totally, totally agree. So where can people find out more about uh, Backstage Capital, Arlen Hamilton, your course? Mm-hmm. All, all. Yes. Thank you. Of you if you go yeah. to backstagecapital.com. To learn all you need to know about Backstage itself, you can also look at our founders and see what they're up to and see if, if you want to apply. We also have an application process. We have thousands of companies that apply a year, so we get in touch if we see something that we're interested in. We make about 30 to 40 investments a year, so it's it's probably 2% of what we see. 
if you go to itsaboutdamntime.com, which is the name of my book, it's about damn time dot com, it'll lead you to my book, including the audio version. I'm celebrating uh recently a, a year of the book being out and it still feels fresh because COVID. <laughs> uh so it feels like I'm having a second second wind of it. And uh on the same site, it's about damn time dot com, you can learn about the academy and that track of if you uh, we have 20 experts on Arlen's Academy, also Arlen'sAcademy.com. Believe me, I'm working on having one place for everything. <laughs> this, right now, this is it. So Arlen'sAcademy.com will lead you to, to the academy as well. And there's two tracks. There's one for the entrepreneur. It's very accessible, has 20 plus experts on it, more content every week. And you get tuition that one price pays for everything. And it is, I think it's the best deal on the Internet honestly, because it's, it's so helpful and people have gone on to, to do so much with it. And then I have a new investor track that is available as well. So very excited to, to see people. I like it. I, I'm going to go check it out for sure. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Arlen. And thanks everybody for listening. And uh, if you like this episode, please uh, give it five stars, subscribe to on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite platform. And you can also follow me on social channels at Kara Golden. Arlen is also, as I said, I know she's on Twitter. She's my Twitter buddy, and I always appreciate her tweets. And finally, um, I have a book out as well that launched not as uh, not as early as yours. As mine launched at the end of October, um, awesome. called Undaunted: Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, and. That's right. uh, yeah, and it's been um, all about my journey of building a company and really not having experience and having lots of de- my own doubts and doubters out there saying, you know, lady with the four kids under six is going to go and do this. Yes. What? You know, so well, I absolutely have to have you on my podcast because yeah, I would love gotta to hear, gotta hear the full story. Sure. Yeah, I would I would love to do it. So, well, thanks everyone. We're here every Monday and Wednesday and I appreciate all of you for listening and thanks again, Arlen.